taking place in downtown Fort Lauderdale. So Museum of Arts, this is Flagler Village. There's billions of dollars worth of new development taking place there. And now a lot of stuff I own is just right over here. So we're going to talk about today getting started, some of the initial steps you want to take, just, just basic stuff to get yourself set up. We'll talk about working through your concepts and how you do that and what you're uniquely equipped for. We'll discuss developing a network and then staying focused on building a track record. Just the, the very basic things that you can start doing today to kind of work towards that goal if this is a goal of yours. Second thing is we'll work through some actual deal examples about creating value. And the deal examples will illustrate kind of how it's done and the ways in which you can do it as a first time investor. A lot of the companies I know when I was going through the program, a lot of the companies that would come in were big companies that are doing million dollar projects and giant deals and so forth. And while it's great to learn about those things, if you're a first time investor, it's far more attainable to be able to do something small as a starting point. So we're gonna walk through those and how that actually gets done. And then we're gonna talk about some funding sources for real beginning investors, right? If, if you don't have access to the country club money or the big investors or big deal partners, how do you actually put together the scrap get your first couple of deals done. All right, first section, getting started. I like this quote from Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, which is now, I mean, enormous, enormous company. And I think this is the advantage that I had when I graduated from the program and bought my first property, is that every dollar that I spent on the property was important to me, so we made it go further, and we were able to do more with it, and we were able to be more focused with it. Once you get to a certain point in the industry, you know too much and you say, man, I don't want to go back and start doing that. But right now, you guys are in the perfect place, and I'll walk you through why, to be able to start doing what you're thinking about doing. All right, so some of the initial steps, and I'll breeze through these, because this is more of a, of a checklist, but it's important. I think the biggest key is that if you're thinking about investing in a property yourself, is that you start early. And by starting early, I don't mean, um, after I buy my, you know, my main house for me to live in, or after I have my first kid, or after I get married, but I mean like, like today or early. Um, one of the first things that you'll need to do is incorporate. If you've never incorporated an LLC in the state of Florida, it's the easiest thing in the world. Um, you can go to SunBiz. It costs about 100 and, 130 or 140 bucks. It takes less than 10 minutes. It can all be done online, and you can have your LLC set up. After you set up your LLC, you can request a tax ID number from the IRS. Same thing, easiest process in the world. It's free, takes less than 10 minutes, and you can do it online also. The reason why you'll need the LLC and the reason why you'll need the tax ID number is for partnership agreements, bank accounts, and legitimacy. If you're going to pitch an investor partner or you're going to a bank, you have it set up, you have it established, and they're very easy, very fast to do it. The state of Florida makes it Seemingly easy. Uh, second thing is to build a basic website. Many of you in here have probably already done that. I know that there's people who graduate from the program who build websites for other real estate companies. So if you haven't done it yourself and you have no clue about it, there's graduates of the program who can do it for you. Um, but there's a lot of resources today. When I started out nine years ago, building a basic website meant coding and all kinds of other stuff. These days, Squarespace, GoDaddy. It's 20 minutes and, and a couple bucks. Um, one of the main things you can do in this program is begin learning about different markets. So whether it's industrial in Dade County, whether it's office buildings in Balaka, whether it's whatever, condos on Miami Beach, you can start looking at the different markets now and begin looking at specific properties within these markets and building your models around them. Just kind of get a basic idea of what could work for you, what works in the market, what has no chance of working in the market. But I think the key with all of this is to start out small and really start taking the baby steps. Don't wait. I think the first property is, is really the hardest. So if you can start with the baby steps and start getting it rolling, it makes it a lot easier. Um, everything that I've ever bought, I still own for the most part. There's been two buildings that I've sold, but everything else I still own. 
So when you start early, it really has that cumulative effect where you know you start out with one and it's really tough, second one's a little easier, third one's a little easier still. By the time you get to fourth, fifth, and sixth, it just really starts rolling, and the next thing you know, you're much further ahead of yourself than you thought you were. After you've set up your LLC, you've set up your tax ID number, I'd work on developing your concept. The concept is really where you want to be at the market and what you're uniquely equipped for. When I got started buying properties, my prior experience had been in Liberty City. I ran a giant shopping center there. I had um, giant, one of the biggest flea markets in America under my management, but shopping center also, Winn-Dixie and so forth. But I was really uniquely equipped to work in inner city. I was uniquely equipped to work with uh, tenants, to, to do all the things that that entails. So when I made the transition to acquiring low-income housing near downtown Fort Lauderdale, it was really just different neighborhood, same formula, same mixture. The second thing is finding an easy access point where you can get into your niche for the lowest amount of initial investment. The reason why, beyond the obvious, that you may not have a ton of money to pour into it right away, is that it allows you to retain full control of your deals. Right? If you have 20 properties but you only own 10% of it, that's not a whole lot. Much better own two or three and own 100% of them. So you're not answering to other folks, you can make your decisions, you can take accountability and responsibility for it. Um, third thing is you want to really find something to be replicated or grown over time. If you have a certain amount of capital and you want to start off with um, you know, $2 million condo on Miami Beach, that may not be something that can be replicated time and time and time again. You really want your first deal to generate enough cash flow that it feeds naturally into number two and number three and number four. Any questions so far? Second thing, so you've set up your LLC, you've worked on developing your concept, developing the network is I think where you really have a major advantage coming out of this program. So the master's program itself will teach you, you know, the skills, the coursework, the math, the accounting, all those things that you need to be able to make it run. But one of the main benefits of the program is that it pairs you with a mentor. It pairs you with your classmates. These are industry peers, potential investors. These are your future deal partners. I mean, if you guys, I don't know if you've done much group projects yet. Once you start doing group projects with other classmates, the same deals that you're formulating and hypothesizing about in class would be the same deals you do outside of the real world. It's no different. Um, on a personal note, my mentor of, of, of many years, my current broker, mortgage broker, banker, all these people come through the NOVA program. So if you don't have these positions in your current class, if you don't have a banker or an investor or hard money, all these folks, reach out to the alumni program because these people <coughs> exist within the program and a lot of these people give back and help out within the program. So if you haven't met or don't know these people yet, find them. I mean, these are the people that can help you. If you have a real estate license, you need a broker to hang that license with. There's at least several rest of the program that are brokers. Um, bankers, there's some bankers who come through the program. There's some big guys who do big deals in Miami for big lenders that have come through the program. There's a lot of folks that can help you get access to the resources that you might need. Uh, third thing, building that track record. The track record is again something you can start off doing while still in the program. And when I say track record, it can be a couple different things. It can be expanded responsibilities within your day-to-day -day role. Uh, you start off in whatever company at this level, you put in the work, you get to this level, you get to this, or just on a project basis. We did a, a 5,000 square foot build out, then we did a 10,000, then a 15,000. Whatever it is within your current job that you can kind of grow with and be able to show is your track record. Um, it can be small investments. When I first started off, I didn't have much of a track record in the residential realm, but over time you build that. And I'll show you later on in the deal examples how that really comes into play and how that really helps you. Um, it can also be working with your mentor. Do you know what stage do they get paired with the mentor at? Is that towards the end? Um, actually, got through the first half of the semester, so the first eight weeks of the fall semester, than most of the people are paired with mentors then. Perfect. Um, so we can just be working with your mentor to create solutions to needs that they may have that either you've talked about or they haven't talked about, sensing what needs they have, looking to fulfill whatever void they're missing. Even if they're with the biggest company in the world, they might have you know, a small niche that they just can't fill. Um, 
that's your track record. But I think the, the key with whatever it is, however you're building it, is that it has to be three things. And I think these will come in handy when you're meeting with deal partners, investors, and banks. And that's, you want to be easily explainable and understandable. You want to be able to tell people in a couple clear sentences what it is that you do and what it is that you can do based off of what you've done. Uh, second thing is you want it to be something that can be demonstrated and tangible. If it's a, a class project, you know, look, this is what I've done, and then I did this project here, and you can show it to your investors, show it to your bankers. Um, and you want it to be something that can be built upon gradually over time. It, it's not going to be, um, I did this 20,000 square foot build out, but now I'm doing 2,000 square foot build outs. You want it to be something that shows growth and shows that you can get there. So after you've done your 20,000 square foot build out, if you have a deal on your own to be able to do this investment that requires a 25,000 square foot build out, it's easy to demonstrate. I've done this, this, and this, and now I can do this. All right, we're going to walk through some, and I'm going a little bit quicker because I know that we're, we're pressed for time today, so please feel free if anybody has any questions or anything. Um, we're going to walk through some, some case studies that demonstrate some of this stuff and demonstrate some of the deal financing. Um, I like this quote because it, it really uh, taps into what we talked about, just getting started early and getting started soon. Uh, first study is about creating value. This was a duplex in Hollywood, Florida. It had been at market for more than 100 days, had over $600,000 in city liens. I mean, tremendous, I mean, 10 times as much as the property was worth. Uh, boarded up, vagrants living at the property. I'll show you some pictures. I have acquired a lot of properties, and this still stands out as one of the nastiest. Uh, and that says a lot. Like, I make a living crawling through nasty buildings. Um, but it had a lot of potential. Geographically desirable neighborhood. Had the potential for solid rents. The structure was solid. Uh, concrete block. Um, slab foundation. Good roof. And the units were large. Right? If you buy a place with small units, can't ever make them large. You can do an addition, so for less sense of once you get the large units, you know you've got potential. These are some pictures. Mm. Now the craziest thing, I mean the pictures is one of those things where the pictures don't quite capture it. <laughs> but there were there were uh, addicts living in there, right? So and there were no working toilets. Mm. Oh. So you had, I mean, needles all over the floor, you had um, like bubonic plague type of junk. <laughs> um, so this was the starting point, but there was potential here, right? For $61,000, it's hard to screw that up, right? But it's difficult to find and difficult to make the deal happen. So if you can make the deal happen, then you know you've got everything going. So the first thing we set out to do was create the physical value. And if there's nothing else you remember from this lecture, it's about creating value, right? Real estate, if you can't create value for yourself, your investors, your partners, there's no point in doing it in the first place. It's all about value, nothing else. So we started out with creating physical value. We went to the city and proposed to settle the liens. And the way we did this is that we had our track record. So I was able to go to the city and say, hey, look, I've done these three other projects. Boom, boom, boom. This is the starting point. This is how I renovated them. We've got good tenants in there. The properties look beautiful now. I've done it here, here, and here. And I can do it here but I can't do it and pay $600,000 worth of liens. So negotiate down to $3,600. The other key with this, yeah. because their other option was they can demolish the property and then they sit on the land and, and they get nothing because nobody's going to pay it, right? The other key is that you want to do this during your due diligence period. So you go into contract for a property, typically you have if it's a small property like this, typically going to close in 30 days, 30 or 45 days. But you'll have maybe a two or three week due diligence period where you can do all your research, everything, and still be able to back out of the deal if you decide not to buy it and you don't lose your deposit. So you really want to have these meetings with the city and do this negotiation while you're in your due diligence period. Because if the city says to you, we'd rather demolish it and sit on this thing, then at least you can back out of the deal, you haven't lost your money, and you move on to the next deal. Yeah. Did, you have, uh, did you have to go in front of the magistrate for that? So we were able to work around the magistrate. We actually got we got rejected by the first three people that I've talked with at the city. We ended up with a fourth person who was a little bit lower down the chain, but just was super helpful.
and she was able to push it through. So I imagine she spoke with the magistrate, I imagine she spoke with some other people, but it got it done. But we got rejected the first couple of times because the first couple of people didn't want to play ball. Did you have to hire an attorney for that? No, I did that myself. Okay. Um, so I have a, 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 a woman that I work with who, whenever I'm going to buy a property, I'll, I'll send her 100 bucks or 200 bucks, and she'll go and research all the liens and fines and that stuff for me. So I don't have to do that myself and dig through the records. So she was the one who came up with it and said, oh, shit, this is what you've got. This is your issue. So then I took that, and I got to go do the meetings with the city myself. I don't know if on a deal like this, if I would have brought in attorneys to handle, because that can take a long time, hearings, costs, and so forth. And once you're under contract, you know, your time is limited. Yeah. How does a, how does a property worth $61,000 accumulate $700,000 in here? How does that happen? And so it's more common than you would think it would be. So what the cities do is, is they'll assess a violation, whether it's for, um, you know, grass being too long. And then if it doesn't get cured, the city gets pissed off. So they'll go out there and they'll cite it for the trees being overgrown and the door not being painted and the fence missing a board. So next thing you know, you got six or seven violations and they're all 250 bucks a piece. So after 60, 90 days, no one's paid them, no one's done anything because the place is abandoned. Then the city gets real pissed off and then they start assessing the, whether it's a hundred, $200 a day penalty, per day penalty on each one of those violations. Wow. So you gotta get six violations accruing six, $700 a day or more for 100 plus days, and it gets up there real fast. And this is not unique to the city of Hollywood. I mean, you'll find this a lot if you have abandoned properties or foreclosed properties. This isn't, this was the first one I negotiated like this for myself, but I've negotiated many since then. Um, it's common, it's a way for the city to really get to move, and sometimes the city will do it maliciously. If they want to own a property, mm -hmm. this is a great way for them to get ownership of it. After I got rejected two times, what pushed you to, to try again? I like the property. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I like the property. I wasn't going to take no. I mean, you'll see with this, right? Especially when we get to the banking part, you're going to get rejected a whole lot. Um, but I like the potential of this, and I saw it, and I wanted to make it happen. And I thought I was right. I thought that they were wrong. I knew that I could do this, and I knew that I was their best chance for to make something good of this property. So when you know you're right and that they're wrong, it kind of motivates you just to find that person that will listen to you. It's a win-win for the city, I mean, for you and the city, right? Yeah. They get a better property there. You know, they get rid of blight. Yeah, and they get their taxes and they get, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a win for everybody. Huh. And so in, in terms of when you um, went to negotiate this lien, you were already in the middle of the contract, right? This is during your due diligence process, right? Correct. So you negotiated the payment of that lien upon closing? Correct, so the way okay. it works is you negotiate it down during due diligence and then they'll write you a letter and they'll say, you, you know, we hereby settle this 600,000 for this amount and you have 30 days to pay, right? Okay. So if you're so you doing your contract here and you close in 20 days, then the day you close, it's taken care of at closing. Okay. So you come up with the cash closing and they write the check to the city. Because they won't issue the title insurance on the property with all of these liens on there anyway, so you have to pay it at closing. But that gives you the city gives you time to do that. Because you kind of featured your track record, would uh, the reduction of the liens be kind of contingent upon you owning the property? So, if you didn't end up closing on the contract and you decreased the liens, you would have added value that you wouldn't be able to kind of take advantage. Yeah, because there's no more liens once you discuss that under contract. Wouldn't you have to have it contingent upon you buying the property, the mm -hmm. reduction of the liens? Yeah, so I guess, I guess it could have happened where, I, so I negotiated the liens down, I closed on the property, I pay off the city, right? So now I own the property for what I bought it for plus lien payoff, mm -hmm. and now I sell it to somebody else. Okay. Right. But that probably would have pissed off the city. My credibility would have been shot. Okay. If I ever did anything else in the city, which I have, there's no way I can show my face around there. <laughs> so the track record matters. Yeah, the track record and the credibility matters. Mm -hmm. You don't know when those people in City Hall are going to be the people who move over to Fort Lauderdale City Hall. Mm -hmm. You're going to be dealing with these people for years to come. Um, so it's just not my game. Um, so we sell the outstanding liens, we evicted the vagrants, we fumigated the property. I invested 18000 to renovate the units. So because we created the physical value, 
that allowed us. Yeah. How many units? This is two units. Oh, just two. Just a duplex, yeah. Um, so we created the physical value, which allowed us to create the financial value. So after buying the property, renovating the property, paying off the liens, we were into this thing for $81,000. Um, this property was acquired with cash. At that time, you couldn't get financing for deals. Now you can. Um, so at this time, I had to buy it with cash and do the work with cash. But all the traditional banks, after you've owned the property for a year, they'll come in and reappraise it based on what you bought it for and what you put into it. So after a year and a day went by, the bank came in and was willing to issue a mortgage on the 70000 So I got 70000 back in my pocket that I'd initially put out for the purchase and the renovation. So then I'm left in this deal with only thirteen grand. So with the thirteen grand based on the, in the deal, right, which is not, it's not a tremendous amount of money. Thirteen grand in the deal based on the rents that I get, 74% return. So when you talk with, with whether it's a, you know, Styles, whether it's DDR, whether it's an equity, whoever, right? If they're acquiring a center or a big development project, if they can get returns, levered returns in the low teens, that's a great deal to do it all day. I've done deals with Equity One when I was in Miami that they would buy for like a six percent return because their cash is so cheap. If you can get a, if your styles and you get returns in the high teens, everybody's high five each other and that's a home run all day long. And this is seventy four percent. Right? Now, small money, it's not big money, right? But small money and it allows you on a first deal Good. to kind of keep accumulating the cycle of through. And now I get 70 grand for my next one. This was the end product. Um, case study two is utilizing seller financing. So, this is another way that you can get the deal done if you don't have the cash to do it yourself. This was a five unit building located in Fort Lauderdale. It was like 30 grand a unit. Now that's, you know, seems low, but it was that market for a long time. There was a cloud on the title. Part of the roof overhang, overhung on the adjacent property. So you couldn't get title insurance, you couldn't get a bank mortgage on it. Um, only one unit was rented. It was like 500 bucks a month. But at least she was kind of keeping an eye on the property. She had five kids and they were like, you know, trash on the outside. But it was little stuff, you know, crayons on the walls and whatever. It was a very tough neighborhood. I own a lot of properties in a lot of tough neighborhoods. This street in particular was, was you know, kind of just a leg beyond um, at that time. There was no bank financing available. I didn't have the cash to buy it all right. And lo and behold, the seller wanted cash only. Um, he was extremely optimistic at the beginning. But there was a lot of potential to create value. Low per unit price. Um, the units were in decent condition. They weren't torn to shreds like the apartments in Hollywood. The one tenant was watching the property, so it was a bit of an asset while I went through closing and redevelopment and all those things I needed to do. At least I knew the property wouldn't go into worse condition while I was getting all my stuff done, and that it had huge potential for the future. Once I got renovated, rented out, it could have some really strong cash flows. These are before pictures. Not horrible, but not great. This room was neat because occupant had obviously blacked out the windows, but painted the ceiling, walls, and parts of the floor all lime green. So it's like you were living in a lime. Um, so this example talks about seller financing. So the banks wouldn't finance, and they wouldn't finance for any of these three reasons alone, but this had all three. So there was no way the bank was touching this thing. No cash flow, poor condition, and then it had the roof overhang, so there was nothing. So the opportunity that I looked for, I met with the seller out of the property, and the seller pulled up to the property in a very fancy car. He come from North Miami Beach. He was an old guy, kind of white hair, and and we pulled up the property. He was very nervous, and he was kind of looking over his shoulder, and you could like you could just tell he did not want to be there that morning, and he didn't want to be in the neighborhood at all, and that he never went to the property, and he didn't know why he bought the thing in the first place. Like he was just, let me take you out of your misery. So what I negotiated with him was that he would finance 100,000 of the purchase, and I put in the other 50,000. And he did that for a period of a year. And during that period of the year, I was able to renovate the place, lease it up, and cure the title defect. I thought I'd have to re-roof the place to cure the title defect and roof overhang. I was able just to chop it off. It was like 1,500 bucks. Uh, 
after one year, just like with the Hollywood deal, I was able to get real bank financing on it because there was no title defect, it was leased up in a good condition, and it was all rented. Uh, so at the end of one year, I was able to get a mortgage of 130,000, so 100 grand to pay off the seller, 30 grand back in my pocket, so now I've got only 20 grand sitting in this deal. Right, so just like the first deal in Hollywood, I was left with 13 grand sitting in it, this one left with 20 grand sitting in it, so it's very doable. Um, after the bank financing, with those rents, it was a huge return, 250% right, per year for as long as you have it. I ended up selling it after 18 months. I needed the cash for some other projects, and it wound up working out nicely. I guess you meant to um, case study three, and I'm, I'm whipping through this because I know we're tight on time, but if you have any questions at all, just shout it out. Um, this was Question three. Yeah. On the previous one, how did you figure out about the, the roof overhang? Um, so I had the roofers go out there during the due diligence period, again, just to make sure I wasn't signing up for something in almost $30,000 re-roof or whatever, because there's two buildings, five units, it's a decent size property. And the roof, I don't know, it was, from an, it was an obsolete feature of the property that at some point was like a nice little porch thing that somebody would have sat on the side for. But by the time I acquired the property, there was a fence right there separating it from the adjacent property. Um, so it was on this side where they built the new townhomes, so it was an overhang. And it didn't cover anything, we were able just to lop it off and, um, you know, flash around and so forth. And it ended up looking perfect and much cheaper. So you stuck with the green. With the green. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once you buy the paint, you buy the paint. So this is four single family homes that I picked up just last uh, last December, about a year ago. So the challenge for this one, and this brings into a couple elements of the different financing for beginners that we'll talk about in the next section. So I use a couple different elements, combine them all to be able to get this deal done. So to do a thirty percent down payment, I need 144 grand in cash, but I didn't have that much cash. I wanted to hold on to it for some other deals that I had in the works. I was closing on a, a three house deal at the same exact time, so the cash was, was at a premium. Um, another challenge, these four properties are part of a larger 65 unit package, and that's something I'd recommend. If you're looking for properties to pick up, if you find these big packages out there, a lot of times you can pick off deals from there. Right? There'll be certain, certain properties within the 65, they don't fit with the others. And if you can pick those off, you can usually get a pretty decent deal on them. Because uh, all 65 are priced at that bulk purchase price. So there's no reason why the seller shouldn't give you that bulk purchase price, even though you're only picking up four. Mm -hmm. Now that's a negotiation. I mean, that's, that's my mindset going into it, right? Um, and then getting a response from the seller was another challenge. Hey, I'd like to buy four of your 65 properties. Click. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> But there was a lot of potential. So one of the good things was that these were already leased up. They were in good condition. I'd already created a track record. And the bulk purchase for me meant lower insurance costs per unit than I was currently paying. And this would bring down the insurance for my portfolio as a whole. So it kind of had a dual benefit. Um, so finding the down payment. So before finding the down payment, the way I went to the, and approached the seller after he hung up on me the first so many times, he had an agent working for him, and she was a little bit out of her league in selling the 65 properties. It was, it was a lot of money. It was like a you know, $12 million deal or something, and she was a little bit out of her league. But I'd done $12 million deals before when I worked at Equity One and Regency Centers. So I called her up, I met her, I said, let's, let's tour the properties, and I toured all of them. And at the end of touring all of them, I said to her, you know, I like these all, but it seems like these ones really don't fit with the others. A lot of it was a part, you know, 16 unit apartment building, 12 unit apartment building. There's a couple of houses, but then these four houses were kind of a neighborhood by themselves, which was a neighborhood that all my own stuff was in. So it was like, these were perfect for me if I didn't talk about this. And so I started talking with her and I said, look, this is my track record. This is what I've done before. I own that property and that property, which are right next to your property. I can get this thing done faster than anybody else can. Bank that's going to finance this for me. I just financed a deal with them last month, and coincidentally, I found out from my banker it's the same bank that the seller has the mortgage on these properties with. So the bank's already familiar with it. So this will be the quickest, most painless thing that he's ever been through. So convinced, and I ended up buying after I bought these four from him in December. I bought another eight units from him in March of this same 65-unit package. 
Um, so a lot of times it gives you that opportunity too. Right? Once you know it and you know the sweet spot and you know, all right, they'll sell for this and they like working with you. We did get that fast. We did what we said we were going to do. Then the next call, at least you're going to hang up on me. <laughs> um, so the way of financing for this was I did a private loan for 80,000, 80% per year. I did cash back from the seller at closing for $10,000, and this was negotiated with the seller, and you can do this too. Ah, you know, I love these properties, they're in great shape, but man, this fence needs to be replaced, or this needs to be done, and I don't want to nickel and dime you. I told you to get this done quick, let's not get it done quick. It's 25 grand worth of stuff, but give me 10 grand at closing and we'll call it a day. Cash back from the seller at closing, and then uh, commission from the seller at closing. So I have my real estate license. If you don't have your real estate license already, get it, like next week, like, get it. So state of Florida, it takes a week to get it. Uh, it's four or 500 bucks, you can take a course and so forth. In classroom, you can do it online too. You take the test, the test is another couple hundred bucks, and within a week, you can have your real estate license. Or, you know, I guess you gotta schedule a test, but quickly you can have a real estate license. You hang it with the broker. There's brokers that have graduated from the program. There's a broker that I hang my license with. And the deal you make with your broker is that if you do a third party transaction, right? If you help your, your mom buy a house and you get commission on that, then your broker gets 20% of it, right? They get whatever their piece is. But for stuff that you buy for yourself, you keep 100%. Right? So that's the deal you make with your broker. So in this deal, this is for myself. And when I negotiated with this my broker, I was like looking at buying my own house. I didn't know I'd buy all these properties. <laughs> so, so if you end up buying a lot, then you get the sweet end of the deal. Um, so commission back at closing, 3% from the seller. So the seller pays you a commission that you can use towards the down payment. On the five unit deal with seller financing, I got commission on that too for 4,500 bucks. The interest on that 100,000 that I had to pay to the seller was 6,000 for the year. So he basically paid his own interest for me. Because you got the real estate license. And you can use this when you buy your own home that you're just gonna live in. If you're not gonna buy investment properties, but get a commission on the home that you buy for yourself or your family. Um, so total cash I was able to raise for the down payment this way was 104 grand. So I only had to come up with 40 grand out of pocket to buy four houses. So 8% of the total purchase price. It's pretty good. Um, Total yearly gross, 60,000. I pay interest on the private loan. I have to pay my mortgage payments, insurance and real estate taxes. So my net is about 57%. All right, again, very, very solid. <coughs> Any questions about any of that? How'd you originally, how'd you bypass the realtor to get to the owner of the property? Well, it's listed on the public record, okay. right? So you can find out who the owner is, you can look up his address, you can find out stuff. Um, these days online, it's so easy. Back, you know, when I first started nine years ago, you really had to do some work to find it. You know, these days it's like finding anybody's piece of cake. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he didn't wind up being most effective, but it did help when I called the agent and said, "Hey, listen, the guy's hung up on me four times. I should have called you from the beginning. You were the person for me to talk with. Let's go see these properties." And it wound up working. Where did, um, whenever you were putting together your contracts for the builds, you were sourcing? Uh, say, say that again? Where is I sourcing the contracts for whenever you do when you do Like the actual con the paper, the actual yeah. contract stuff? Yeah. Um, so there's a couple forms that I use for the contracts. If it's a, a small deal, I think for, honestly for, for anything up to four or five units, um, maybe even a little bit bigger, this is a standard form on the MLS once you have your sure, realtor's sure. license, uh, just a, a commercial transaction form, um, and use a standard yeah, standard contract that both parties are good with. You don't have to do anything special with attorneys, all that. I write them up myself. I might have my broker glance it over for, you know, if it's a first or second deal of mine. Um, but you can write them up yourself. You save the attorney's fees. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, this was a great quote from Cheryl Sandberg. Um, because when it comes to funding sources, like with the deals, negotiating deals, so if you're gonna get rejected a lot, I think when I first got started, when I first got started, nobody was lending. So you got rejected by every bank. You got by, rejected by banks you didn't even apply to. They were just going to like, hey, gonna reject you for the one um, And most of them, you know, two or three times. But after you build a track record and the market improved, now it's like, you know, they're calling you, hey, what do you got, you know, you're working on deals, right? So it gets better. But in the beginning, it's about failing and failing and failing, which is another reason to start early. So we're going to walk through some alternative funding sources. We're going to 
talk about some of the, the least formal and work our way up. And for all of these, there's a lot more options today than when I first started, or than even there were two or three years ago, with proliferation of online lending, and even Fannie Mae is doing things just in the past year with investment properties that they weren't doing at any time before. Um, so remind me to talk about that if I don't catch it. Um, first one, friends and family. The key with friends and family, and it may seem obvious, but it's to start early. So if you're building your track record, keep your friends and family informed about it. Just that, you know, just in an intellectual way that, hey, I'm working on this, oh, and then I did this, and then I did this. So when you come to them and say, hey, I'm working on my fourth project, and I need some cash for it, it's an easy yes, because they know what you've been doing. It's not out of the blue, and you're saying, hey, I need, you know, whatever for this great idea I have. No, it's, <laughs> I have my track record, and I want you to be part of it, and we can do it together. Um, Approach as a loan, pay interest, even those friends and family. Friends and family can cause a lot of problems. Paper it out, have a plan for repayment. It may seem obvious, but make all your payments on time. You may think that you're only going to go to them once for money, and you make all the payments on time, you do a great job, and everybody's happy with it, and you, you close them out and so forth. But two or three deals later, it worked out for you. You may go back to them, and they'll be happy you came back and said, well, we know they're good for it. You got your track record, and you've done all the things you're supposed to do major payments. Um, friends with equity, I thought was a bit of a creative one. I had a friend who, his grandmother passed away, he inherited a house up in Boston. It wasn't a big house, it was like a $200,000 old house out in the country and so forth, but he inherited, didn't have a mortgage. He was able to get a home equity line of credit on the house, which is very cheap money, at like 25 or 3%. I was able to borrow the money from him at 8%, so he was happy, he made his profit, I got my money at 8% to go out and, and do my deals, but same rules apply as family and friends. Paper it, document it, keep them informed before you go to start it. And he came to me with the idea. Um, he said, hey, if I can get some cash out, could use the money. He wanted to invest, there was no, he didn't have the expertise and there was no area where he was at to be able to invest in. So he came to me with the idea and I said, that sounds like a win-win. Um, third one, and obviously I'm not a retirement advisor, but I've gone to the 401k well, I mean more than once. If you have a 401k, you have an IRA, you can borrow from it. Um, typically up to 50% and it's low, it's low money. It's you know, two to three percent these days, maybe it's like three and a half percent, but it's still cheap money. And as much as it takes cash temporarily away from your retirement account, it allows you to retain 100% control of your deal. So you're off and rolling. Um, I'm gonna speed this up a little bit. Uh, typically five to six year payback, and again, cheap money. These are slightly more formal, and this category of the slightly more formal has expanded a ton in the past, just 24 months alone. So when I started, there were groups like Discover, like the uh, credit card people, but they have a private lending division. But now you got Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan Chase, there's so many more groups that are in this segment. Um, typically up to 35 grand, decent interest rates, but it's only five or six years, so your principal and interest payments each month are high, so you really don't want to have it out for too long, so you pay it back early if you can. Peer-to-peer -peer lending, very similar. This is one group that I've worked with, but now there's so many in the segment. Um, and then acquisition commissions. We talked about your realtor's license, getting the commission back from the seller. I do this on every single deal, and it just adds up over time, and it goes towards the down payment, and there's nothing that I'm more grateful for than having cash for the down payment. You know, aside from family, friends, and health. Right. Right. <laughs> um, these are more traditional sources. So for acquisitions made in cash, you can typically finance 70% of the purchase price almost immediately from all your big banks. Um, after 12 months, you can refinance, get the cash back out. Now something that I wanted to mention that wasn't available more than 12 months ago is that Fannie Mae, the residential lender, the enormous residential lender, just in the past year, they've done before, but it wasn't really available. In the past year, they made it available where you can do 80% financing on investment purchases. So I picked up a couple of homes up in Orlando in the past year, past six months or so, and you know, a $90,000 home, if you're putting up 20%, that's 18 grand. If you get commission back from the seller at closing, then you're down to like 15 grand, you get some cash back at the seller, from the seller, you're down to 12 grand, so for very little, for stuff you can put on a credit card, you're buying a house. Now obviously you won't put it on a credit card and so forth. <laughs> but the fact that Fannie Mae is doing this financing is very unique and you can do it repeatedly with 
with them. You can do up to 10 properties with them before you have to bundle them all together and get a real commercial lender. And then you can start over. But that's something new. Could you just explain? Um, I don't understand the idea of being a commission seller. Like, that just doesn't make sense. That's you know, really so if you hired a real estate agent to, do, to negotiate the deal for you, right? if you hired a buyer's agent, then the seller would pay them a 3% commission. So because it's just between you guys, you get... I'm the agent. I'm the agent and I'm the buyer. And, and, uh, yeah. I've never had anybody object to it. Right? Sometimes, eh, the ground, you know, moan about it a little bit, but nobody's ever rejected it. It's legitimate. Um, if I had an agent, they'd be paying them. It's just pay me. And they don't care how it's applied. They write me a check and close and you pay it towards the, the down payment. It makes no difference to the bank. So this idea, you talked about um, early, you talked about a couple times actually, where uh, you, you buy, you bought the property and then after you did that, Renovated and everything, you got the cash back out by refinancing. Yeah. You still owe the money to the bank, right? So how do you, how is that your money if you put, it, and you put the cash in the market? How is that? Yeah. Well, you're paying a mortgage on it. That's right. Right. Yeah. Any property you're gonna pay, you're gonna have a mortgage. Yeah. Right. But if you get the cash out, it's cash in my pocket, so I can use that for the next property. Yeah. And I get a mortgage on that one. So it's kind of like right. So if you're buying a property, it's a distressed property. The bank's not gonna necessarily lend you going into it like that five unit deal. Banks wouldn't lend to me, no, right? If I got the cash in my pocket, I may not need that bank to lend to me, right? But after I renovate and make it nice, then they'll lend to me. So it's kind of a, a reverse. They won't lend to me going in, oh, but they'll lend to me coming out. And it's fine to have a bank mortgage on the property. It's like a bank mortgage on all of them, but it allows you to keep that cash coming out so you can recycle it, and that's the trick. If you get into a property and you have your mortgage and you put all your cash into the down payment, then you're done. I mean, yeah. until you raise more cash down the road. That's right. But if you can keep recycling that same cash, then it really starts to multiply, right? So the cash with the the duplex in Hollywood, where I'm getting a whatever the return was, six to seven percent return on my thirteen grand I left in there. Well, that cash I'm now taking, so I'm adding that seventy percent return to now the five unit deal where I'm getting a two hundred fifty percent return, right? And I'm taking that to the next deal. So that money. Right, it's just like compounding interest, yeah. but you're compounding at big numbers now. So that small bread and butter deal, after you've got a couple of deals at fifty percent return, oh shit, it starts to add up. And you're subtracting the mortgage from those percentage of returns. That's that's after the correct. Yeah. After, yeah. after you pay your mortgage, your insurance, your taxes, your expenses, all that. Um, and then we talked about seller financing. A couple of keys with seller financing, and then we're done. Um, usually it's short term. They typically don't want to do more than a year, 18 months, two years. Um, slightly higher interest rate. The one I did was at 6%. It doesn't have to be a higher interest rate. Nothing dictates that. So don't let the seller come off like, hey, I'm going to charge you 10%. I'm buying your property that you know is a good investment because you bought it as an investment. So let's do 6%, or let's do 5%. Um, have an attorney draft the documents, and usually it's fast and efficient the closings with self financing because you're not waiting on the bank. You do your due diligence, seller drafts it, and you're in, you're out. Um, it's ideal for sellers that really want to sell. You really got to feel them out. Sometimes you can search on the MLS, it's a listing criteria for seller financing, so you can find it that way. But there's a lot of deals that you can do with sellers who may not list self financing but would consider it. And you just got to talk them out, feel them through it. And I find it really helps if you can make them uncomfortable. So another example that I read, when this guy came to the property, he was nervous about the neighborhood. We did it for like a Friday night. <laughs> like the person wants, but anyways, out, right? Loud music's playing, people are driving down the street looking at the, you know, the old guy sitting in front of the property. Um, so you can do things like that. Um, you go out to a property, uh, you know, I see on, on your rent roll, we're looking at these five units. I see you and three hasn't paid the rent. Let's knock on the door. Right, and they say, oh, shit, no, I don't want to do that. I'll, I'll text her. And, um, so there's lots of ways, you know, um, in Oldham, though, we used to use the shopping centers, you know. Oh, yeah, you know, how, what's the condition of the roof? Oh, it's a great condition. Great, let's climb up there. Right, I don't want to in the trunk. Let's do it. And they're like, well, I didn't bring my climbing boots. Like, oh, okay. uh, so anything you can do like that that helps them is just a little... And then it gives them the chance to see what else they own. If they've done a deal with you and they've been happy with it and you get close fast and you do the things you said you're going to do and you don't nitpick them and you just, selling is a painful process for anybody that sold a house or anything. If you can make it easy and painless for them, they will love you for it. 
when I bought the four houses from that guy with the big package, and then I came back to him a couple months later for the eight units, it was it was the easiest thing in the world. We barely even negotiated. I knew that he was going to go super high on the price. He knew I was going to go super low. We just skipped the whole damn thing and met in the middle. Um, he knew what I needed, how much time I needed to close, so we didn't have to negotiate it. But he knew that I would close sooner than I needed, so he was happy with that. Same bank, same bank. It was done. But it gives you that opportunity to get to know the sellers and see what else they have that's listed or not listed. All right, in conclusion, we talked through the initial steps, getting started early, developing your network. Right here, you guys are in the midst of it. You've got your mentors, you've got your classmates, you've got people coming to speak to you, you've got you've got them all. Um, developing your concept. You can start working on this today. You, there's free sites out there, there's LoopNet, there's paid sites like Coaster on MLS, and you can just drive around and you can find the neighborhoods that you like, find the types of properties in the neighborhoods, and start putting together your financials. You'll find that there's some neighborhoods and some asset classes that you can cross off right away that just don't can't afford these days, you can't get the returns on, but you'll find something that you can. Um, and then work on that track record. This is something that regardless of if you're gonna buy property today or next week or next year or whenever, you wanna get that track record going. Even if you're looking for a job when you come out of the program, that track record's gonna be key. Um, we talked about some deal examples, creating value, utilizing self-financing, and then multiple down payment sources that you guys can all use and not have to pour a lot of capital these deals and find a lot of capital. Yeah. When you get into a deal, it looks like there are some that you keep and there are some that you just get, get out of it. So yeah. what's your philosophy in terms of how long, what you can, what, what, what's your time frame in keeping this for the deal? So I, I keep everything. Um, I sold that five unit building because I needed the cash back out for a couple of the deals I was working at. And then I sold the five unit building I had up in West Palm Beach just because it ended up being geographically a little bit too far from me. Aside from that, I've kept everything. Um, I don't think you can make money flipping properties. Right? Once I make a TV show about it, you know you can't make money at it. <laughs> right? I've never been able to figure out you know, that asset. Right? So everything I buy, I hold for the long term. You get a lot of benefits from holding long term. You get um, much better tax rates. I mean, the way the tax system is written, if you invest in real estate, it is like just the benefits are just proportionate to the amount of work that you're putting in. It's a great system. Um, just from real estate investing taxes, that part of the system is, is wonderful if you own properties. Um, if you sell a property within two years of owning it, you have to pay a much higher tax rate than you do if you sell it <coughs> having it long term. Um, you get depreciation by holding onto the property. So if you own a million dollars worth of property, you get to depreciate 30 grand of it each year. So your first 30 grand that you collect in rents, you pay no taxes on, none. Um, if you manage to spend all the money the business makes in a year on renovating and investing in new properties, so the business generates zero profit for the year, but then you still have that 30 grand depreciation, you get to subtract that 30 grand from the income on your day job. So if you make 100 grand on your day job, you subtract that 30 grand, you only pay in tax on 70 grand, right? So, you, so the benefits of holding the properties for a long time are tremendous. If you don't have a day job and you do only this, and you manage to spend all of the money that you make on the business during the year, Right, so at the end of the year, you spent, you made 100 grand in business, but you spent that 100 grand renovating new properties that you acquired, so your profit's zero. But you've got that depreciation of 30 grand, you can take it, put it against your wife's salary or your husband's salary, so then they're paying taxes on a lot less. So the benefits of owning the real estate long term are much greater than selling it, and instead of selling it, you can just take a new mortgage out. So you're holding the properties long term, so you don't worry about the market going south. You don't worry about this stuff? I don't worry about this stuff. You know, if it goes down, I'll buy more. If it goes up, I'll probably still buy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that's one of the things, right? It's, it's, you can't think about timing the market, right? Because nobody knows, right? And the market's going to go down, and going to go up. But at certain times, right? Like when I bought the first property in Hollywood, the prices were low because the market was down. So it's great. So you think, oh, it's a great time to buy. But rents were low, yeah. right? The vacancy was high. Yeah and no banks were going to touch it. So that was a horrible time to buy or in all those respects. Now prices are higher, but you can get bank financing. Occupancy is like, I've been at 100% for years now, right? And the rents keep climbing. So you think prices are high, so it's a bad time to buy, but it's a great time to buy. So it's just finding, it comes down to the value, whether it's a down market, up market, you gotta find something where you can make that value happen and not rely on the market for it. Yeah. 
actually, I have a two-part question. Um, one, with the areas that you own a lot of stuff, with all that new, the new development that went on there, did you see a, a slowing of your absorption rate, or people wanted the newer stuff, and that affected you? Yeah. Because it was just more units there available in that area? So a lot of the development taking place is, is still very much going on, yeah. but you'll see in the residential market, everything being built out there is, is upscale. Mm -hmm. Right, it's all high end yeah, product. It it's all it's all luxury. It is, yeah. It's all right. Even if it's class B product, but they name it luxury. Right, they throw in an extra swimming pool or you know a yoga studio, right? A, a brewery in the basement. Um, so it's all it's all high end product. Which is not what what you're. Which is not where I'm at. Right, there's no low income product being built out there because you can't build the stuff for what I can buy it for. Right, if, even if you were to build a, a low income housing development. You're building it for maybe 150 grand a unit, right? Just construction costs, just, yeah. right? So if you can buy for under that, then you've got that bumper. I mean, that's that's a moat. So the and your castle. The other part of my question is, so after we're in your depreciation time, yeah. Because if you hold on to these properties for too long, now you've eaten up your depreciation, and then you're paying these taxes, and then everything becomes lower. Your end. Yeah number becomes lower. So like have you figured out a plan on where you're gonna let go of so that you're not <coughs> making any money in the end up when you sell? Yeah. yeah. So I mean the depreciation is over twenty seven years. Yeah. Right. So when I get close to twenty seven years I'll probably meet with the I close it at twenty seven years. I'm not at twenty six and a half. I'm not even close. But the thing you can do to avoid taxes too is that if you sell the properties you can roll that money into a 1031 exchange. Yeah. So if you take those profits, you put them in a 1031 fund, and then you buy new properties with them, yeah. then you start to 27 years all over again. Okay. So I imagine the exit, if I still want to hold them at that point, will look something like that. So I'm, I'm sure you're watching Opportunity Zones with Faith Pro. Yeah, so Opportunity Zones were something that um, just coming off if we got stopped, but um, so opportunity zones were something that when Trump passed his tax act last year, opportunity zones were a part of the act and they established certain zip codes and certain geographic areas in different cities around the country. And if you buy a property and you invest in these opportunity zones and you hold it for seven years, then you avoid a large part of the capital gains taxes. If you hold it for 10 years, you avoid almost all of it. Um, all of my properties happen to be in a an opportunity zone, because <laughs> I saw the opportunity before they called them opportunity zones. But I think what that means, if you own properties in the, so it's good if you want to buy properties in this neighborhood. That was an incentive that I didn't have going in. I think out of my properties, only one recent one, the eight unit building I bought in March, would qualify for that benefit down the road. But they'll all benefit because as people are now coming into these zones and saying, we got my property in these zones, and there's billions of dollars of funds being raised on Wall Street for these zones. That's going to lift all the prices. And you're actually in one of the viable opportunity zones. Right. There's some opportunity zones that are really close to cities yeah. that have a lot of development already taking place. And then there's some opportunity zones where you're like, mm, I don't know if that's so much of an opportunity. <laughs> yeah. The last guidance we heard um, was that you know, even if you're a current property owner, you'll still qualify. I think they're still writing the rules. I think we'll know more by the end of February. Uh, um, all right, so we talked about funding sources, peer to peer lending, private lenders, 401k loans, all the good stuff. And that's the end of it. Thank you, Thank you. Without, without, going oh, much, yeah, without going into much detail, in the past uh, year, how many properties have you purchased since the market has been steadily climbing? When did the market start steadily? Climbing? Well, just <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Since it's going crazy, I guess I start. I don't know. So I guess last December I picked up like seven houses. I picked up an eightplex in March. A couple houses in Orlando over the summer. I picked up a house in November in Fort Lauderdale. I don't know, 15, 16, I guess. All right. Second question: you Use property management companies on all your properties, right? No, I do it myself. Yeah, I do it myself because one. I mean, main reason nobody's gonna watch your money like you are, yeah. right? Nobody's gonna care about the dollars and cents and what you're spending and what you're collecting like you are. Yeah. Nobody. Um, 
Number two, it's, it's the only way to really keep your hands on things, right? This tenant's doing great, they got a new job, you know everything about them. I know I can get more of an increase come renewal time, or I know this one just had a baby, I'm gonna get some diapers delivered to the house, or whatever the case, right? To make it, all my tenants have been with me for a very long time, not all, but most, right? So I have tenants that have been with me six, seven years already. Um, so it just makes it that much easier. You reduce your turnover, you have a better relationship. They're not texting some management company who may or may not call them back. If I'm getting text, I'm hitting them back or call them back, right? You can do those things if you manage it yourself. And typically management companies in the neighborhoods I'm in charge you 10% management fee, maybe 12% management fee, and that's off the top, that's off your gross. So that really messes up your returns. Okay, so two part. Do you yeah. have a team that works with you that help you manage all of that? Yeah. And or and also, if you have gotten a deal and it didn't work out, and why you didn't? Good question. Um, no, so I, I, I do it myself. So I have people I call in for if I need different things, right? I have a GC I'll call in if I got some questions about this. I have mm -hmm. brokers, attorneys, those people. So, um, but in general, you manage all your properties yourself? Yeah, I manage them all myself. I have a guy who helps with the leasing of them just because I don't want to be running back and forth if I got a vacancy to show and all those things. I lease some of them myself, mm -hmm. but all the management I do myself. And then um, a deal that didn't work out. So I had one of my one of my early acquisitions was a five unit apartment building up in West Palm Beach. It was the first commercial mortgage that I had done. Mm -hmm. So it was a real learning experience for me in terms of acquiring that mortgage, what the banks need to see, what they look for, just learning that process. Mm -hmm. The property I ended up selling because it was a pretty high intensity property, just the amount of work those tenants there required. So I was making a lot of trips up and down to West Palm Beach. Um, I had a newly born, newly, I had my second child just been born, my first child was very little. Um, so it was like, I'm making these trips up there at 11 o'clock at night or 4 a.m. before I go work in Miami or whatever the case was. And it was like, man, this isn't sustainable. So I ended up selling it. I made a little money on the property, but not a lot. I thought the rents were low when I bought it. I thought the rents would go up and the market would get better. I think it's, looking back now, I say, you can't really count on the market. You gotta know what you can produce and not assume the market's gonna drive up the rents and that you'll be okay and you'll be good. So that never happened. And to this day, I sold this maybe five, six years ago. To this day, the rents in that neighborhood are still <laughs> at that level, man. It's like a two bedroom's like 650 bucks a month. Right? Um, and you're like, how can you make money off of that? I thought, I'm like, listen, two bedroom, it's gotta be a minimum 800, 850 a month. But you can't assume that because you don't know when the market's going to change. Maybe 20 years from now, maybe two years from now. <laughs> but I can't wait that long. And the work required. But so while the property itself, I made money coming out, but it wasn't much. But I think the lesson I took away from it, it was still success in the sense that it was my first commercial mortgage I'd done. So I learned a ton about the process. I got experience working with the bank, and that bank ended up doing my next like three deals for me. I worked with a broker on that one. That was the first deal where I got a commission for myself on. So I, I learned that part of the process. Um, I hired a management company for that one because it was in West Palm Beach for a short time. And and that's where it really cemented in my mind about all the things I told you about yeah, hiring a management company. Yeah. I'm like, well, listen, they charge me 10%. I can do it better than them. <laughs> it pains people to do the work. And I know I can do the work better, right? But it's like, you don't know those things until you go through it. Okay. So it was a failure, but I learned. Anything else? Thanks again. Yeah, so thank you guys. Okay, we're going to take a two minute break and we're going to come back and get started. Okay? And when I say two minutes, I do mean two minutes. <laughs>
If you have one, I think what? I'm not sure if it's going to be email or not. I don't know. 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 Oh, a couple. Okay, let's go get started. All right, so we're going to finish up. We're going to do a quick little review of some of the things from last week, um, and then, uh, then we'll jump into the new material, and then you're going to do two quizzes at the end of class. Okay, so basically, my goal is to be done with the, the lecture material within the next, um, let's say, hour and a half. All right, so you'll have about an hour and a half for the two quizzes. Okay, so. Starting off with kind of the, uh, the income statement, uh, we talked a little bit about this last week in terms of kind of putting that together, in terms of potential gross income, and then subtracting out vacancies and collection losses, adding in other income to give us effective gross income, subtracting out total operating expenses to give us an operating income. Okay? Everybody remember that, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, so let's just start off, and let's say I give you this kind of baseline information over here. What I want you to calculate is net operating income, all right? So, get busy. Symbol right for the hat, son. Square feet. Oh, I've never seen that one. So one 
basically just assume this is like a little shopping center or something like that. So you've got 2,000 square feet at $20 per square foot per year, 5,000 square feet at $15 per square foot per year, and then 7,000 square feet at $12 per square foot per year. And you know, one sort of thing that you might want to just begin to think about is the logic behind that is smaller spaces tend to pay more per square foot than the larger spaces do. Yeah. Okay. Isn't that most of the time what they do is bring in like the big anchor, they don't pay much Absolutely. Per and then they kind of rape the small guys? Let's walk through this real quick. All right, so the first thing you're going to do is to calculate what the, the rents are um, in terms of potential gross income. So you're going to take the $2,000 or 2,000 square feet times $20 per square foot per year. It's going to be $40,000. The same thing here for unit B, 5,000 square feet times 15, $75,000 of income, and the 7,000 times $12 per square foot or 84,000. Add those three together, you get 199,000. That is going to be your potential gross income. Okay, everybody good with that? Okay. Your vacancy and collection losses are going to be 15% of your PGI. So here, 199,000 times 15% will be 29,850, which we just at least subtract out. And then you're told that your other income. Once again, we talked about this last week. It could be from a whole variety of things. It could be from parking fees. It could be from you know, other on-site vending machines. But just sort of non-core income, $5,000 a year. We add that back in. So that gives us an effective gross income of $174,150. From that, we subtract out our total operating expenses. So our operating expenses are going to be 20% of effective gross income, so 34830 Subtract that out, and that leaves us with the property's net operating income for the year, 139320 Okay? Everybody good? All right. Now, assume we have an 8% cap rate. What do we think we can sell this property for? Or what would, would we say the value of the property would be with an 8% cap rate? Okay, so let's just make sure. Again, put our little, we got Irv, which 
in this case, 139,320, an 8% cap rate. 1.74. So 1,741,500 would be the estimated value of the property, okay? Just based on the 8% cap. Now, if I were to ask you, for this particular property, as it stands right now, what would be the gross rent multiplier? Well, we talked about this last week. What would be the gross rent multiplier? What are you doing? Value divided by PGL. Okay, you're going to take your value of the 1,741,000. 500 and do what? Divide by the PGI. Divide it by the PGI of 199. Okay. So let's see what we end up with. So we end up with a gross rent multiplier of 8.75. Now, what do we say that number meant? That simply means that this is where the income multiple, if you will, that the property would be generating if it were sold. Okay, so in other words, it's selling at an 8.75 multiple of gross income. All right, make sense? Okay. Um, so let's say that the property were actually listed for sale at 1.5 million. Okay. If you think it's eight, yeah. All right. Oh. So if it was listed for sale for 1.5 million, how would you, based on the analysis that we've done, how would you perceive this deal? Good deal, bad deal. Good deal. Good deal. Good deal. Why? Because it's being priced significantly below what we're saying the value should be for the property. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, with that listing of 1.5 million, what is the implied cap rate? Okay. So in other words, we kind of go back and we sort of now back solve for the cap rate. Yeah. So 139, 320 divided by 1.5 million. And we would end up with basically 9.28% as the cap rate. Okay. So what is that sort of imply about the owner of this property relative to, let's say, you? Lower value. He values it lower. Less risky. He's or, not educated. No. He's not no. Educated. <laughs> he actually perceives it to be more risky. Okay. That's why he has that higher cap rate of, uh, affiliated with it. Okay? And he's saying it's worth less because he perceives it to be potentially more risky than what you do. Okay. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now all of this we've already sort of gone over, this is just sort of a quick review, okay? All right, so one of the things that we may want to do is adjust the income from one year to the next. Okay, and we want to potentially grow our rents, all right, as we start to put together an operating statement. So assuming that this is year one, and we want to grow, let's say, the income by what percent from one year to the next? Three percent. Three percent, okay? So we want to, in essence, grow that 199000 by three percent. How do we accomplish that, okay? It's relatively simple. We can kind of go down here. I've already got 199,000 here on my, my sheet, so I'm just going to 
do it very simply. We would multiply it by itself, which would be 1, and then tack on the 3% growth rate on top of that. Okay, so we multiply it by 1.03. Mm -hmm. All right, so in this case, we would just simply take 199,000 times 1.03. And that would give us 204,970. Okay, now implicit within that, obviously, is that each of these would be growing at 3% as well, but we're not really going back and readjusting all of those at this time in terms of our inputs. We're just simply saying we're going to make the assumption that from one year to the next, in this particular instance, we are growing those rents at 3%. Okay, is everybody cool with that? Yes or no? All right, now, then we can sort of begin to see the flow through effects. All right, our vacancy and collection losses, if we assume those are going to stay at 15%, then we simply multiply by 15%. So now our vacancy and collection losses have gone up to 307, or let's say six rounded. Okay, so 30,746. Then our operating income, I'm sorry, our uh, other income, we're just going to assume it's going to stay constant just for this problem. So 5,000. All right. Let's go ahead and recalculate our EGI. And we should end up with 179, 224. Operating expenses at 20%. We're going to keep that constant. Okay. So 179, 224 minus 35, 845. Would give us 143, 379 as our new net operating income. Okay, everybody cool with that? Mm -hmm. And then we could go back through, you know, the same old sort of routine and say, well, what would that mean? Our cap rate is, and so forth, so on. But at least you get the idea of making that adjustment to that income, and then seeing what the flow through effect is going to be. Okay. Now, just for fun, I'm not going to ask you to do this inherently on the on the quiz. But this increased, the income increased by 3%. We agree on that, yes? But what is the flow through effect in terms of the bottom line income? All right? Well, to do that, what are you going to, in essence, do? You're just simply going to take the 1.43, or sorry, the 143,379 divided by 139,320. In other words, kind of the new number divided by the old number to see what the growth rate would be. All right, so let's see what we get. 143, 379, divided by 139, 320. Not much different. It's actually 1.0291. So not quite the 3%. It ends up being 2.91% as the, the growth rate in the income, okay, in terms of just the flow through. All that means, and the reason why that there's even a little bit of a difference is because we didn't like grow the operating income, okay? We didn't grow or lessen the operating expenses, okay? So because of that, then that didn't get adjusted a whole lot. It got adjusted a little bit primarily because we didn't grow the operating income, okay? All right, moving forward. I think because my calculator is set on too few digits, it went right to the Okay, hit the, the shift key. Hit the equal key, which is DISP, display, and then hit 9. And I'll kick it out to 9 decimal places. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So, one of the things that we typically will do is we will go through and we'll have sort of year one all the way to maybe let's say year five that we anticipate owning the property, and we have calculated the net operating income you know, for each of those years, 
but yet we're wanting to sell the property at the end of year five. Okay, is everybody with me on that? We're going to sell at the end of year five, but what we do as a matter of convention, we've talked about this before in, a, in the real estate finance course, but we're talking about it now for the new people and also kind of make sure that you latch on to this, is that when you're looking to sell a property at the end of a year, you look to the following year's predicted NOI to then use that number when calculating your reversion value or the sale value. And the reason you do that is because income or the income approach is always a forward-looking or future-looking sort of valuation. And so let's just say hypothetically for year five, our net operating income was $100,000. But in year six, we anticipate that it's going to actually go up to $105,000. Okay? And we want to calculate what the reversion value or the sale price should be at the end of year five. Well, if we had just taken the year five number, and let's say that we had a 6% cap rate that we were going to use, all right? So 100,000 divided by 6% would mean a value or a reversion price of $1,666,667, yes? But by using the year six number at that same 6% cap rate, We actually get a higher reversion of one million seven hundred and fifty thousand. Okay, because here's the way to look at it: if you're if you're buying the property at the end of year five, if you're buying the property at the end of year five, you're not getting any of the past income numbers, are you? So the first real income that you're going to be receiving as the new buyer will be the year six income. So shouldn't that be the value, or shouldn't that be the income that the value gets based on? Yes, would be the simple answer. Okay? All right? So that's the way to sort of think about this, is that since that is going to be the first income that you, as a new buyer, are going to receive, then that's what you should be basing the value estimate on. Okay? Not on how much was received. Okay? Questions? As the buyer, though, I wanted to use your five. Well, of course you do, especially if it's you know a much lower number, okay. But it's normal convention to sort of say what are your expected next year rents based upon you know rental increases based on predicted you know occupancies and so forth, so on. Okay. I was, right? only, gonna, I was only gonna say that that's a prediction anyway, the 105, right? Based mm -hmm. on the track record and other. Absolutely. Right. But it's prediction hopefully based upon evidence, specifically leases that you hopefully have signed for that next year. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. That's agreed upon. Is it something I come up with or how is that? It's just normal, it's normal convention that you are going to make the assumption that as the purchaser of the property, I mean, why would you care in one sense? I mean, yes, you do care that the property has generated rent or it's not generated rent in the past because you don't want to buy a property that, you know, is potentially not going to be able to generate rent. But going into it, hopefully your expectation is, I want to know how much money I can make off of it. And most of the time, you're going to probably be repositioning it yourself and you're going to be saying not just maybe what the, the rents are based on the previous owner, but you may be locked into those because maybe they have already signed the leases for the property for the next year. And so you're stuck with that to a certain extent for that year. You follow me? They could have already, there could be a built-in increase in the yes. leases from before. Yes. So you, you could see it more solid. But, but it also could be the case that you know once you acquire the property, that as soon as those leases expire, you're going to kick everybody out you're going to renovate the property, and then you're going to get a new batch of tenants that's going to pay even a higher lease rate. Okay? But based upon the income that it's generating under these circumstances, that's going to be your value. I have a question. 
So let's say year six, you actually lose two tenants. Sure. So now the value actually goes down. Even though year five is one six six, the value the theoretically cost, yes. Okay. Now, what most people will say, well, what is the likelihood of getting it released? Okay. Now, if it's a if it's a residential property and in a reasonable neighborhood, then you're going to say, okay, that's going to be an easy release, you know, done, not even going to really think about it. We're talking about commercial retail space. But if you're talking about something like a fairly decent size, you know, commercial retail space where the market has been in kind of a free fall, then you're, you're going to say, well, that, that likelihood of getting a new tenant at that lease rate may not really be possible. So, quite frankly, yeah, the value wouldn't go down. Okay. Make sense? The landlord's not going to be happy, but yeah, I'll have your... Yeah. Yes. Okay. I mean, most of I mean, I mean, the obvious thing is, you know, if you're an owner, you want to sell at what you feel like is the peak of the market, mm -hmm. you know. But being able to sometimes predict that, I mean, you can have your own sixth sense about, you know, what may be happening. And if you can kind of get a sense that retail as a general sort of market is, is struggling and there doesn't seem to be any immediate rescue for it, then you know you kind of got to say, well, I know I'm going to start losing tenants. Maybe I need to sell now while I still have some tenants. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Moving forward. Let's see. Okay. One more sort of uh, internal rate of return, net present value thing, and then we're done with that material. We can move on to the new material. All right. All right, so this is sort of start off. And let's say that we've got a property and it is generating this. We can, we can sort of throw out some numbers, but I'll go ahead and just sort of start populating this. So let's just say $10,000 a year. Uh, maybe next year is 15000 The following year, 13000 the next year, twelve thousand, and then this last year, maybe fourteen thousand. All right, are the income numbers off of the property on a before-tax basis? All right. Now, at the end of all of this, we're going to make the assumption that we can sell this property for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay. So there's our setup. Now. My question to you is how much should we pay for that property here at time period zero, assuming that we have a hurdle rate of, what do you want it to be? 12%. Okay, I heard 8%, I heard 10%, we'll make it 9%. Okay, so you have a hurdle rate of 9%. Okay, now. You tell me how much you would be willing to pay for this property here at time period zero. In other words, what is its net present value at time period zero? Okay, well, I'll give you a little bit of a head start and then I'll jump in.
Okay, there's the setup. Okay. Are right, matching up? Yeah. Okay. So what we're saying is that with that set of cash inflows, with a nine percent fertile rate or required rate of return, that we would want to pay no more than one hundred and forty-six thousand nine hundred twenty-seven dollars and seventy-five cents upfront at time period zero. Does everybody understand that? Yes or no? Okay. Now, so. If we were to sort of switch this around a little bit, and we were to say, well, what would happen? Instead of paying that, we paid, let's say, 130000 for this property. Okay? What would be the internal rate of return? Okay. Now your setup would be somewhat the same, except for this step, you would have 130,000 change the sign to a negative cash flow. And then instead of putting in an interest rate and solving for net present value, we would simply solve for internal rate of return for the year. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so let's just do that real quick. He hasn't made it up. No, because that's what you're solving for. Yep. Uh, well, the purchase price in that case, yeah. And we would end up with a required or a uh, internal rate of return of 12.17 percent. All right. So all that means is no way of looking at this is that if instead of well, okay, we're just going to set the scenario up. If our hurdle rate were nine percent. That means that we could have paid as much as 146000 for the property, okay? But why would we want to pay any more than we have to pay? So let's say that we can negotiate down the purchase price of the property from something greater than 146000 down to 130000 is what we actually end up paying for the property. Then what we're asking is, well, what would that actual rate of return be if that's all we pay? So it's it's definitely going to mean that our internal rate of return is going to be greater than our hurdle rate because we're paying less. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. Everybody good with that? Yes, no, possibly could be. All right, so let's do this. Would you prefer to go ahead and just take this quiz now and get this one out of the way? Yes. yes. I figured you would. <laughs> <laughs> I will, be, I will be passing out your answer sheet here in a second. I'm going to give you the questions first so you can go ahead and start working on it.
people got 14s, no one did get a 15, but but they all missed different questions. So it wasn't. I gotta keep it competitive.
right? Nope. Yeah. Yeah. Oops, I'm just going to keep it.
Yes. 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 more minutes and then we're going to be done with this in order to move on.
just to be clear, everything from question 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, all three, all of those build on top of the previous question, okay? They're not standalone, in other words. Five more minutes. Okay, it is time. So let's get these things turned in.
start lecture at 10 15. Okay, last call. Give a grade right now. Roughly. All right, so 
Believe it or not, the guest speaker today played right into this material because today is all about taxation. Woo! Aren't you excited? All right. Now, the, the first thing I always say when we start dealing with this material is you have to understand the tax world is an artificial world, okay? And it is created by regulation, okay? And that regulation does not always match up with the real world, okay? So there is a tax world and there is a the real world, all right? And there are two, in many cases, very different worlds in terms of, of how things flow and what things make sense and what things don't. So that's the thing that you've got to always keep in mind when we're talking about the tax world, is we talk about some of these different rules, we talk about some of these different formulas and things like that, and you're going to say, well, that doesn't necessarily reflect reality, or that doesn't necessarily make sense, or, or whatever. You've got to attribute that to, once again, the tax world is a regulatory world. Okay? Everybody with me on that? Okay? Now, okay, so some of the first things that we want to, to, to sort of jump into in, in, the, in the tax world is to understand the difference between repairs and maintenance expenses Okay, expenses versus capital improvements or CapEx. Okay, or capital expenditures, by the way we're getting. All right. Real briefly. Anyone want to try to just kind of very quickly tell us what is the difference between these two, okay? Uh, basically, one is not affixed to the property. Anything has to do with um, renovations gets depreciated over a certain amount of time? No. Uh, not, not quite. Okay, Kyle? Um, r and is the one like short term. Yes. And CapEx is the one like long term. That's a simple explanation. Yeah. Okay? And, and that's typically the way that we want to try to look at this, okay? So repairs and maintenance expenses typically are going to be over a year, over one year or less, okay? Capital improvements are going to be basically more than a year. But when you say over one year, you mean like over well, the course of one year or like more than one year? Yeah, well, how they're going to be treated for tax purposes and how you're going to deal with them in terms of, of the, the, the actual out-of-pocket expense and then the tax benefit that you receive. Now, I'll, I'll explain it here for me in a second. Okay, so repairs and maintenance, let's, let's just sort of start with these. Okay, examples of repair and maintenance expenses, if you own, whether it's a shopping center, apartment building, whatever, this is going to be whenever you go in and you do routine things, okay? You basically, you know, if you've got a hole in the carpet, you patch it. You've got a hole in the roof, you patch it. You know, if you've got a, a broken air conditioner that needs to be fixed, you fix it. You know, those are typical sort of repair and maintenance expenses. Okay, is everybody clear with that? Capital expenditures or capital improvements are things that substantially improve the useful life or extend the useful life of the asset in some way. So this is where, instead of just patching the roof, you would replace the roof, okay? And putting a new roof on the building, theoretically, is gonna extend its life, okay? Does that make sense, yes or no? Yes. Okay, going in and doing a complete retrofit to a building, putting in brand new carpet, putting in you know, new doors, you know, uh, repainting everything, putting in all new ceiling tiles, all of that would definitely be considered to be a capital improvement. However, if you were to come in and maybe paint part of a building, or part of a room, or just part of a facility, chances are you could claim it as a repair and maintenance expense. Okay? And we're going to talk, and you're, some of you are sitting there saying, well, why do we care? Well, the reason we care is because the tax treatment is different for each of these in an extreme way, okay? And so, 
you have different strategies, much like the speaker was talking about this morning. You know, depending on what your strategy is as an investor, whether you're going to be a buy and hold investor or you're going to be basically a buy, renovate, and sell investor, that is going to dictate how you want things to be attributed for tax purposes. Does that make sense? Okay. And it's not a little thing. Okay. It can mean huge dollars of savings or cost if you misclassify it one way or the other. Okay, does that make sense? Now, most people who own a property and intend to own a property, much like our speaker this morning, because what did he talk about? For instance, the 47 properties or so that he owns, he was saying he's only sold two of those. All the rest he has continued to own and intends to own for many years to come. So he would definitely be classified as the buy, renovate, whole sort of investor, okay? Under that scenario, he is going to be employing the strategy of classifying as much as he possibly can as a repair and maintenance expense. And the reason for that is because you get to write off and immediately expense that, that entire cost in that tax year, okay? So in other words, if I spent $50,000 on repair and maintenance expenses, all of that gets to be written off against this year's income. Does that make sense? But if that $50,000 had been classified as a capital improvement, I would have to amortize it over many years in terms of the tax benefit that I would be receiving from that, okay? And so most investors want to get the immediate benefit if they're going to be holding the asset, you know, for long term. Now, if they're going to be selling the asset within a couple of years, they may choose to have everything classified or as much classified as a capital improvement, okay? Because the tax treatment on that would be a little bit better, okay? So that's what I'm sort of talking about. We're going to work through some examples. We'll show the numbers at some point. But right now, I just want to kind of wrap your head around the concept. Okay? Is everybody cool with that? Okay? So, real quickly, replacing an entire roof, what would that be? Capital, Capital expenditure. Okay? Patching a roof. Repair. Repair and maintenance. Okay? Now, I've told the story, so some of you, you know, in the world of finance class, you may have heard this before, but many years ago, I was living and, and working and teaching in Austin, Texas, and I never will forget that this one property that I lived in, residential property, and the owner of the property, um, you know, look at the window and, the, and, and part of the roof is being replaced. Now, keyword, part of the roof is being replaced. And what this particular owner was doing over the entire property, and I swear to God, I am not making this up, he was literally replacing half of the roof, okay, you know, and leaving the other half as is. And you're just sort of, you're standing back and you're scratching your head and you're saying, why would anyone just replace half the roof? Why not go ahead and do the whole roof, okay? And, and so I, you know, went and I was talking with the property manager and, and I was saying, you know, well, so what's going on? And he's like, well, yeah, he's doing it for tax reasons. And I'm like, okay. And so, of course, I started investigating it and then find out what he's wanting to do, because he's a long-term owner, is he's wanting that to be classified as a repair and maintenance expense, okay? So if he does up to half of it this year, then the following tax year, he can effectively do the other half and then write off that entire expense immediately against his income. Whereas if he had replaced the whole roof in that one tax year, he would have, in essence, had to amortize that over the expected life of the roof, which may be 10, 15, 20 years. Okay, does that make sense? And then therefore only getting the tax benefit incrementally over that time period. Does that make sense? Now once again, tax world versus real world, okay? You expended the money this year, but the tax laws simply say, just because you expended the money this year doesn't mean we're gonna give you all of the benefit of that this year. We're going to say, no, 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 you have to basically allocate that over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Does that make sense? Okay, so question here and then question here. So when the new owner buy the house or buy the roof that's getting depreciated over 10, 
and then the property over 27 or, or 30, depending. How would that? Uh, the clock starts over. Really? The clock starts over for the whole property. But basically, whenever ownership changes, legitimately ownership changes, okay? Now, we do some sort of crazy little shuffle, you know, internally within a family or within some sort of a, you know, company that, that is, is too closely held and, and scrutiny would sort of say, yeah, this wasn't really an arm's length, you know, transaction. That, that's a whole other situation. But if, if you buy a property that I am selling, you're the new owner, the clock starts over for everything. Okay, in terms of the depreciation clock, which we're about to get into. Okay, question. So I buy a property, I replace the roof on it, and then in six months I sell it. When do I take the? That it's it's all the the, the expense is going to be attributed at the time of sale. At the time of sale. Yep. Okay, that's why that that strategy would make sense gotcha. because that's going to reduce your right. capital gain. Right. Okay. Ah, yes, the electric is going to start to go off. And that's what happens with this whole discussion is that little bits and pieces and they're going to be, oh. So, okay. Now, let's kind of move on to, to one of the next topics which kind of embedded within this is the whole topic in which you brought up of depreciation. Okay. Now, in your mind, <coughs> maybe just in some cases, having heard this word for the very first time, depreciation. Okay, what does that imply to you? Reduction in value. Reduction in value. Okay, something depreciates. It basically, the, the, theoretically, what you're saying is it's going down in value, or it's becoming worth less, or it's deteriorating in some way. And so you're, you're trying to say, well, how much does it go down in value? Or how much does it deteriorate? Or how much um, you know, do we need to account for in any given year? Okay? Does everybody understand that conceptually? Okay, now, the IRS sets two broad categories for real estate. There are other little nuanced categories that we don't need to get into. The two broad categories are residential versus commercial. Now, residential is, we're not talking about owner-occupied residential. In other words, we're not talking about your house that you live in, okay? We are talking about homes or apartments that you would invest in as an investor, not an occupant. Okay, is everybody clear with that? Yes or no? Yep. Well, if you occupy uh, one portion of the... <clears throat> that complicates things. Okay. Because then you... And that's, no, no, it does. Because then you have to exclude that portion okay. out of the whole. Gotcha. Okay? And so in many cases, while... And it can... I don't want to get too deep into that, yeah. but, but it, it can be beneficial, but it can also be detrimental. Okay. Okay? All right. For residential properties, the depreciation term that the IRS or Congress has set is 27 and a half years. You heard him saying 27 years, well he just rounded it off, but it's 27 and a half years, okay? For commercial properties, it's 39 years. Now, once again, this is why I say tax world versus real world. These are arbitrary numbers, okay? These are numbers set by Congress, and specifically I think these numbers were set in around 1986, okay? A long time ago, all right? And prior to that, the numbers were actually lower, okay? I think it was like maybe even down to like 15 years and like 31 years or something like that. The point being is at any given time, whenever Congress decides to effectively revise the tax laws, they can go in and effectively revise these and say depreciation term is going to be longer, shorter, or different in some way. Now, the general thought process if you have to say there is one associated with this. And the reason why residential properties have a quote unquote shorter depreciation period is because in most of the country, they are built with inferior materials. Florida is a weird place, okay, because we have, no, because we have hurricanes, okay. Most of the country, or at least a good portion of the Midwest, they don't have hurricanes. They may have tornadoes, but they don't have hurricanes, okay? And so we build things 
both residential and commercial to a much higher standard, you know, in terms of concrete masonry units and brick and, and so forth. Whereas a place like Texas, you can go out and build a house for next to nothing because it's all just two by fours and a little bit of plywood, okay? And, you know, and, and, and that's perfectly fine. But here, you can't do that, all right? But my point with that is, if you're building homes out of pretty much two by fours and plywood, the expectation is they're not going to last forever, okay? I mean, yeah, with maintenance and so forth, you can maybe, but, but the thought was they're not going to last as long, so we're going to give them a, a little bit of a shorter depreciation period, okay? With commercial, the thought is, okay, most of these properties are being built out of steel, they're being built out of concrete and brick, they're going to last, you know, substantially longer, so Congress said, okay, we're going to give them an extra, you know, 12 or so years of life because we feel like they've got a, a longer lifespan, okay? That's the logic, okay? But at any given point, Congress can step in and sort of say, that logic, throw it out the window, we're going to make it all the same, we're going to do it, you know, some totally different way. But right now, that is what is in force, okay? Now, what that means is that if we have a property that let's say is a $10 million property in both instances. If we take and we divide that 10 million by the respective depreciation terms, let's see what that what number that gives us. Okay? So this one is going to give us three hundred sixty-three thousand six hundred thirty-six dollars and thirty-six cents. Okay, down here it's going to give us two hundred fifty-six thousand four hundred and ten dollars and twenty-six cents rounded. Okay, now. That is the dollar amount each year that we would be able to write off on our income taxes. Much like he was talking about this morning, that you get to write off that number against whatever income the property is generating. Does that make sense? Okay, and not pay tax on that portion because the assumption, the assumption is that for tax purposes, the value of this property over one year, it has gone down in value by $363,000. Physical value, okay, and tax value. Now, you're saying, well, wait a second, the market's going up by 10% and, you know, all this other stuff is happening. We've got, you know, just explosions of, of value, you know, creation all over the map. <laughs> How can this thing be going down? This is for tax reasons. Okay, it has nothing, nothing, nothing to do with the real world. Okay, it is all about the tax treatment. Okay, so it has gone for the purposes of income tax. This would lower your taxable income by 363,000. Whereas if the property were classified as commercial or non residential, so this would be basically office buildings, shopping centers, industrial properties, resort properties, okay, that are not necessarily residential. When I say resort properties, non-residential, we're talking about hotels, okay? Hotels would be classified as commercial, not residential. And the, the, the distinction there is if it's something that people are living in longer than a month at a time, it's pretty much considered to be residential. If it's short-term rentals, it's pretty much considered to be commercial. Does that make sense? Okay, but now single family homes, apartment complexes, townhomes, condos would all fall in the residential category. Is everybody with me on that? Now, once again, if you are the owner occupant, none of this applies. Okay, that's a whole different set of tax laws. Okay, for owner occupied residential. <clears throat> now, one of the things that can happen is, well, you can have a mixed-use property. For example, you have retail on the ground floor or office on the ground floor, 
and then maybe the next two or three floors above that are all residential. So how does that copy get classified? Well, the interesting rule is if it's 80% or more residential, the whole thing gets treated as residential. Is that by square foot or by... by uh, Pretty much by, by square foot. Okay. And so that's a good thing because as you see, which one of these has that, the bigger depreciation amount? Residential. residential. So if you could classify that ground floor retail or office space as residential because the whole building gets encapsulated in, in this, you would prefer to do that because you're going to get a substantial additional write-off on your income taxes by having the whole thing classified this way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Less than that, you have to separate that. Well, less than that, you simply um, you would you would you in essence that's probably going to be the, the easiest way to do it. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how many units it's in, uh, let's say it's a 300 unit, no, it's, it's that's like, still it's, residential as long as people are living there right. as homes. Right. Okay. Okay. Now there gets to be all these little nuancy sort of things, but for our purposes and just kind of understanding, it's roughly, like I said, 80% <laughs> is kind of the general standard, residential, 20% commercial. Yep. So almost all the mixed use that are being built right now are considered residential? In most cases, yes, because if they're, if they're going to be more, in other words, just think about it like this. You have a five-story building, mm -hmm. okay? Then you could have the, <laughs> if you have a five-story building, then the top floor floors, floors that would be 80% of the building would be mm -hmm. residential, the bottom floor retail, it makes sense, yeah. okay? And that type of building, you get to classify as all residential. But if you only have maybe a four-story building, not so much. Okay. All right. Moving forward. So, does everybody kind of understand this piece? Now we're going to get into the to how this fits into the income statement and that sort of thing a little bit later. Right now, I'm just trying to do some of the basic calculations. Okay. Are we we clear with the calculation? Chase. Just what's the difference between depreciation and amortization? Okay. So depreciation is strictly for tax purposes of how much you are, in essence, writing down the value from one year to the next. Amortization is simply saying you are allocating potentially an expense or you are allocating some sort of a charge over a number of periods, okay? Whereas depreciation is more of a tax thing, whereas amortization is really more about typically allocating expenses. When do you realize that, that, that 363, is that... Uh, that you, you realize it immediately ahead? that tax year. The first year. Well, there's a caveat there, which we're about to get to. And that is, in the first year of operation, we have something we have to call the mid-month convention, which I'm about to get into. But for every year after the first year, that would be the dollar amount. Okay? Now, so you, you jumped ahead a little bit of me, so let me... Let me <coughs> So, this is yet another tax world situation. What the IRS does is it asks you to tell them when you bought the property and placed it into service. Okay? Now, those could be the same day, but it could also be two different days. You could have bought the property in January, but you maybe did some renovations to it over the next two or three months and did not effectively open it for business in terms of getting your occupancy permit and occupy it until maybe March, okay? That's when your depreciation clock would begin. Would begin when you placed it into service. Does that make sense? Now, you may prefer, for whatever reasons, to go ahead and place it into service the moment that you buy it, but if you're gonna be doing a bunch of renovations to it, you actually probably wanna get the tax benefit of that if the intent is to sell it you probably are going to then want to defer that place in the service date until you have all those done. But if you're planning on being an owner forever, then it, it may not really behoove you to do that. You may be better off placing it in the service the moment you acquire it because then you would be able to probably come closer to being able to write off all of those expenses 
as they occur. Even though you're renovating, you're going to try to maybe classify them as repairs or maintenance. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So within that first year, that place in service date matters. Okay. So if you bought it in, let's say, January the 1st of the year, which is the assumption many times that you know, we sort of make with our models, we, we, we buy it January 1st, place in the service January the 1st, you would think you would get a full 12 months worth of depreciation. Yes? No. Okay. The IRS makes the assumption that if you place it in the service, regardless of the day of the month, that you place it in the service the middle of the month. Okay? Now, the reason they do that is strictly, to, in their minds, to simplify things. Okay? <laughs> Because they're basically saying, if you acquired it at the beginning of the month, you acquired it at the end of the month, or the fifth of the month, or the 20th of the month, we're just going to round all of it to the 15th of the month and just make that assumption that that is when it was placed in the service. So, having said what I just said, you bought it January the 1st, you placed it in the service January the 1st, the IRS is going to assume you're only going to get a half a month of depreciation, so your depreciation is going to start on what day? January 15th, my birthday. Okay? Now, so. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. All right. So I can remember it. All about depreciation. Okay. So, you're automatically going to place in the service on the 15th of the month. Now, what that means is this place in the service in January, that's 11 and a half months. February, 10 and a half. March, April. May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. So let's kind of continue this on down. Nine and a half months, eight and a half, seven and a half, six and a half, five and a half, four and a half, three and a half, two and a half, one and a half, and half a month. Okay? So, real simply. If we bought the property and we placed it into service in the month of May, how much depreciation would we get? Seven and a half. Seven and a half months worth of depreciation. Does that make sense, everybody? Yes or no? Okay. If we bought it and we placed it in the service in November, how much would we get? 1.5. 1.5. And if we placed it in the service December 31st, how much? No. No, you get point. You get half a month. Yeah. Okay. You get half a month. So in one sense, just a, a simple thing, a very simple way to get a, a teeny bit extra depreciation each year is to place the property in the service on the 30th or, or the end of the month. Okay? Because then you get the previous, basically, 15 days or half a month. Okay? That is why, in many cases, you see closings occur at the end of the month for a lot of real estate properties. You're all like, why do they want to wait until the end of the month to close, you know, and part of that is for tax purposes, okay? All right, now let's just do a couple quick calculations here. All right, so we have this $10 million property, all right, and we said, okay, over 27 and a half years, that was 363, 636, Three six, okay. Or six five six, six three six. Okay. <coughs> All right. Now take that number, divide it by twelve, so we can get a, a monthly amount. Okay. So the monthly amount is going to be thirty three oh three oh three per month. Okay? Is everybody cool with that? Yes or no? Yeah. Okay. So, simply put, if we place it in the service for the month of January, what we're going to do is simply take that 303303 and multiply it by 11 and a half. So that means Instead of getting $363,000 worth of depreciation, 
we're only going to get 348,484.85 rounded. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay, so if we placed it into service, let's say in May, then we would say we'd be taking 3303.03 times seven and a half months. Or 227, 272, 73. All right? Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So you're the higher. Um, so you're going to get more depreciation the earlier in the year that you acquire and put the property <coughs> into service, so is the simple thing. So yeah, and so it, it, you, you, it, it, in a perfect, yes, in a perfect situation, yeah, you probably, you know, close in January to be able to maximize, you know, the, the, the appreciation for that year. But the reality is that just because we go by calendar year for some things, many businesses actually have tax years that are different than that, mm -hmm. okay? So you as an operating business can choose to have your tax year maybe start like, for example, here at the university, mm -hmm. our tax year begins July the 1st, okay? So for tax purposes, everything starts July the 1st and runs through June 30th, okay? <coughs> and most organizations have, whatever they start, they have that ability to a, adopt their own sort of, of tax year because it's, it's all predicated typically by maybe their business cycle or when they started the business. Okay. I'm not trying to get into all that detail, but for the purposes of for the, the real estate, in a, in a, if your tax year was the same as the calendar year, then yeah, you would maximize your benefit if you put it in service in January. Okay. Other questions. Now, the um, the approach here would be the same if it was a commercial property. Then, if it was a residential property, the only thing that would change would be instead of 27 and a half years, it would be 39 years for the commercial property. But all the other calculations would, in essence, be the same. Would they, but you said um, if it's a business, you can choose when your year starts. Yes. So if it's a commercial property, it wouldn't be. Well, no, no. Your business is different than the real estate, is what I'm saying. I got it. Okay. We're not even oh, concerning ourselves with the, the business. Right. Tax on the business. I got it. Right. Okay. All right. <laughs> this is part of the reason. I mean, those of you that are saying, oh, my God. Well, this is part of the reason why, sadly, we have to have entire master's degrees programs in taxation. And you have entire law degrees focused on taxation is because of just the Byzantine sets of rules and guidelines and that, change all the time. That, that potentially are changing and, and ultimately giving one person a benefit and, and somebody else not so much just based upon how they react <laughs> to that tax law, okay? Does that make sense? Because, like, just without getting in, I don't want to get into any politics. I'm going to make sure I'm very clear about that. But with the recent tax law changes, one of the things that happened was a limitation with respect to the write-offs that you can have for your real estate, okay, for your personal real estate. Not for investment real estate, but for your personal real estate. And what that, in, in essence, we began to do was to make certain states less attractive to live in for tax purposes than other states, okay? Well, you've already begun to see some impacts of that. People that were maybe living in New York saying, ooh, the tax burden has just gotten heavier because we're no longer receiving some of the write-offs we used to receive. So let's go somewhere where the tax benefits are more favorable, like Florida. I mean, you have an entire, even before that change, but you have an entire population here, obviously, many of you may not be aware of this, but an entire population that come down to Florida for six months and one day out of the year so they can qualify as a Florida resident and avoid having to pay state income tax in whatever home state they're from. Okay? And that is a huge boon for Florida 
and it's why that whenever you go to places like Naples in the middle of the summer, you have all these places that are boarded up, and you're like, what the heck is going on? You know, because it's not in season, you know? So anyway, that's a whole other discussion, but the, the point being is it's motivated by tax law and weather, okay? In Disney What? And what? In Disney In Disney Okay, moving forward. Um, okay. So let's say that we get a loan and we have a, a property that we acquire for, let's just let's start with our $10 million. Okay. So let's say that we get a, a loan for $10 million. But part of that loan are loan origination fees, or fees that we've got to pay potentially upfront on the acquisition of this loan. And so let's just say that those loan origination fees are 4%. Okay, so. Now what I'm doing, just to make sure that you're, you understand, I'm taking a bunch of topics and I'm isolating them. Okay, and what we are ultimately going to be doing is we're going to take these isolated topics and then we're going to put them all together into a spreadsheet. Okay, not today, but ultimately that's the goal. Okay, so right now we're just kind of going through and trying to explain what each of these are and what they sort of mean. All right, so loan origination fees, in this case, this is a fee that you pay to a lender for basically making you a loan. All right. And in this case, we're saying the lender is going to charge you up front 4% of the loan amount to actually make that loan, okay? And, and what I mean by making that loan, that's all their due diligence, that's all of the paperwork preparation, that's everything, okay? All inclusive. That's a lot of, a lot of money to pay up front, but nonetheless, you're going to have to do it. All right? So, real simple, 10 million times 4%, 400 grand. in loan origination fees. Okay. Now, you say, okay, I wrote a check for that. Yes? No. Well, you did. <laughs> well, you, you did you indirectly, you but, but yes. You, you indeed did write a check, or you indeed did incur yeah. that expense, okay, of the $400,000 up front whenever you got the loan. However, for tax purposes, the IRS will only allow you to write off proportional to the term of the loan. So, if the loan term is 10 years, so if loan term, let's say 10 years, then that means You would, for tax purposes, only get to write off $40,000 a year of those expenses. And the, 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 rationa the rationale, once again, tax world versus real world, the rationale is that you pay those fees for the benefit of receiving that loan, and that loan has a benefit to you for 10 years. Therefore, you are allocating those costs over that 10-year period. Now, the question that hopefully some of you are going to ask is, what if I pay off the loan early? Okay, if you pay off early, then you get to write off everything at the time of closing. It's like, for example, if you, if you sold it after five years, you would have, in essence, paid off half. So at the time of closing, at the end of five years, you then get to write off the other two two hundred thousand dollars worth of loan fees. Okay, does that make sense? Yes or no? Okay, question. Okay, so this, that harkens back to the other capex question too. I had so with with this, let's say that you don't have enough of a capital gain to offset this. You're jumping ahead. Okay. So the 10 years is based on the loan term. <laughs> the amortization period, amortization period is based upon the loan term of 10 years. So in this case, each year you're amortizing $40,000 of loan fees. 
Does that make sense? Even though you paid for them up front, you get the tax benefit over 10 years. Okay? What do you mean you pay for it up front? Like well, and it works. Okay, you go into a lender. The lender says, I'm going to give you a $10 million loan. Yeah. Boom. They give you $10 million. Yeah. You, in turn, write them a check back oh, for $400,000 okay. okay. having received that loan. So you really only receive. You're not getting really $10 million. You're really only getting basically $9,600,000. Okay, I understand. Well, I have a fee on a loan when I just give 10% less. They don't make what? Like, why even give me a $10 million loan if you're going to take, like, why don't I just call it a bad Because, like, you know, we cover that in advanced class. Okay? So hold that question until then. We can jump into it. So then if you sell it in year eight, you would deduct 80000 and then at that point you would be able to allocate them. Well, you would deduct 80% in your eight. So it would be 80000 to be... Basically, right, to be 320,000 would have been deducted at that point, and then whatever the, the remaining um, 80,000. 80, yeah. okay, I'm sorry, I thought you were talking about that. The other way around. Okay. But yeah, 320,000 plus 80,000. Okay. I don't understand. Why are you paying the loan origination fee when you got to pay interest? So you're paying both? Okay, That's yes. It's that. another way for the lender. No, no. It's an, uh, it's an additional way. It's, we covered that in the finance class. But it's an additional way for the lender to make money. If you remember, oh, right. if you remember a lender makes money several ways. They make money off of the interest. They make money off of prepayment penalties. They get money off of administrative fees. And they get money off of loan origination fees. So they always make money. Yes. It's a hidden way for them to make additional money. So my first Okay? That's why I take the half money. That 4% is not as punitive as the 2.5% over the life of the loan. Right? It's less. It's less. It depends. Okay. Let's move forward. All right. <laughs> All right, so let's make the assumption that um, we buy a property, um, when do we want to buy it? Multi-family. Uh, no, when, when, what month? In March. February. Uh, okay, we're going to buy a property in September. Do we want it to be commercial or residential? Residential. Mixed use. Mixed use. In this yeah. case, I can't compromise and split it in the middle. So you know, we're going to stick with, I guess in this case, commercial. All right. So for September, okay, is three and a half months left. All right. Now, all right, what is going to be the dollar amount of the property? Let's say it's 10 million. All right. So 10 million. Divided by 39 years. We are 256, 410, 26. And then divide that by 12. We get our monthly amount of 21,367, 52. Okay, all right, so in this case, September, we said, would be what? 3.5. 3.5, so it's going to be 21,367.52 times 3.5 months, okay? So 74,786.32, so that would be our depreciation in year one. And that's again, if you close on the property and make it active that month. Correct. Okay. Correct. Are the loan origination fees not counted into the total cost of acquisition? No, because that is, that, that's, that's separate. And, but our value here is our total cost of acquisition. Acquisition is different than the loan. Right, right. I follow. Okay, so it's treated separate. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So we've got the that that is our amount of depreciation in year one. Now let's assume 
Um, How long we yeah. In this particular case, I've, I've been, okay, so that would be the dollar amount for the depreciation in year one, okay? Yeah. Is everybody cool with that? Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to throw a new wrench into this, okay? So the new wrench is for the property, what percentage is made up of improvements? What percentage is made up of land for the total? Okay. Now, what we mean by that is if you think about a property, part of its value is the land value. Part of its value is the improvements value. Okay. Well, for tax purposes, they get treated differently. Okay. Of course they do. All right. So the thought process once again, try to be somewhat logical, is that land does not depreciate, okay? That land hopefully holds its value forever and ever, it's reusable, it's renewable, blah, 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 okay? Now, of course, we can all probably come up with circumstances where land would lose its value in the sense of, okay, there's a cemetery there, or there's a hazardous waste dump there, or there's, you know, some other, you know, toxic something or another would cause the land value to be zero. But barring all of that, normal circumstances would dictate that land does not depreciate in value. Okay? Doesn't mean it can't go down in value in terms of market forces. It simply means that the depreciation or the devaluation or usefulness of the land does not go down. Does that make sense? <coughs> Whereas the improvements that are made to the land in terms of buildings and structures and, and things like that do depreciate. So what we have been doing up to this point is just kind of making the assumption that we get to depreciate everything. That $10 million or whatever, we were making the assumption that everything is all inclusive within that $10 million. Okay? What we have to do now is to be a little bit more refined or more sophisticated and say, all right, what percentage of that overall value are we attributing to improvements and to land? Mm -hmm. And then only the portion that's attributed to improvements gets to be depreciated. Okay? So if we were to say All right, if we say the whole property is worth $10 million, okay, and we want to, to establish the, the value of the improvements relative to the land, what we might say is, okay, the land is, let's say, worth 20% or $2 million. The improvements are worth 80%. Or eight million. What does the IRS give you? Give me a, give me a, I'm going, I know where you're going, okay? Give me, give me a second, okay. So we have this allocation of 80% attributed to improvements, 20% attributed to land for the total of 10 million. Okay, now, I, the question that you're, you're, you're wanting to go toward is, well, does the IRS give you any guidelines or guidance as to how this allocation occurs, okay? Yes. And you've got a couple of different ways you can get at that number. One is if you buy the property as dirt, there's nothing on it, okay? And then you build on top of that dirt, then you can use your original cost basis for that dirt as being your land dollar amount and then add in the improvements, okay? That's one way. Okay, the second way is if you bought it, it's all built, it's all there, you could have within the contract, whenever you bought the property, you could have isolated it out in the contract and say, I am paying two million for the land, eight million for the improvements to the land. There's a minimum. Well, a reasonableness test, okay? The third approach, is to have an independent third-party appraiser
come in and say, here's how much the land is worth, here's how much the improvements are worth, and then you come up with the allocation that way. Then you have the fourth approach, which is you go to the local tax office, okay, and you see how they have broken it down as to what percentage they have allocated to one versus the other. But you've got four choices, okay? Now, most investors, and hopefully you have already figured out, you want which of these two numbers to be as high as possible? Improvements. Improvements. <laughs> because that is where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck with respect to the depreciation. Okay? But that number has to be established up front. That allocation has to be established up front whenever you put the property into service. Because you are going to have to be putting that number down on your income taxes. And you're going to have to substantiate it using one of those four approaches, okay. okay? Now, the IRS, if you, and, and, and you phrase it, you know, quite well, and just simply, there's probably a minimum, you know, number. Well, put it this way. <clears throat> if all the properties in this area are trading at around 20% of land relative to improvements, and you say, hey, my land's only worth 5%. Audit. Chances are, yeah, that's going to trigger an audit, and the IRS is going to come in and say, defend it. Okay? How did you come up with that 5%? Well, I just read it out of the air because I thought it was a nice small number. Okay? <laughs> they're not going to go for that. Okay? They're, they're going to say, you know, we're, we're not happy with that. So my point is, as long as you follow one of the more, the other probably three rules of, of simply saying, okay, it's based upon, you know, what original land values are, you have an appraiser, or you use the tax office, you're going to probably be squeaky clean and get through without a problem. Okay. So if you if you own land, like let's say that guy that has the cows on the land, yeah. On you, he's he's owned that land. Whoever owns that land has owned it forever. Now, say they decide to build something, they probably bought the dirt cheap. Right, right, right. 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 And they want to say, well, I, this is the price I paid for the dirt, and that's my land value. And now I'm going to put sure. all my money now with that. If, 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 if you can show that your historical value is this, it's a, it's a chance that you're taking. Okay. Here, here's, there's, there are no guarantees mm -hmm. as to what the IRS is going to choose to audit and what they're not going to choose to audit. Okay. But it's usually a reasonableness test. Okay. Okay? Granted, I am not a tax accountant. You know, um, and you know, you get into the weeds on that sort of stuff, and you can, you know, argue all day back and forth with you know the different players. And I think I told the same story in the finance class, but I mean, many years ago, I had a professor, and this he ha had another professor, was a tax professor, do his taxes, ends up getting audited, gets called before the IRS, and is having this whole argument, you know, back and forth, and the the the, the person that does taxes, this tax professor. You know, finally, you know, just said to the IRS agent, said, look, I know what I'm talking about because I wrote this section of the tax code, okay? And so, you know, it's like, boom, drop the mic, you know, and then <laughs> done, you know, at that point. But my point being is a lot of tax law, you know, there are so many nuances, so many little details that you can get so mired in, you know, those things. But what you're trying to do is avoid an audit, avoid... Obviously, anything that would be, you know, improper, um, because no one wants to go through that. And so, yeah, you can be very aggressive in your tax treatment, but realize that's probably going to trigger an audit. Okay, but if you're reasonable about what it is you're doing, chances are the IRS is going to sit back and say, okay, that looks fine to me. Move on. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, what if? I know this is an extreme, like, hard scenario, like it's never going to happen, but what if you were to have a tiny piece of land, you put this huge skyscraper on it, and then there's all these properties around it that are small properties on a large piece of land. The percentages are different. Would it be calculated based on the acreage, or would it be yes. calculated? Okay. And to a certain extent, the use. But once again, it's going to be one of those things that is 